If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Hello, I'm the real fake Johnny Cash and I want to tell you about Big Coal's big plans to strip mine American lands and send millions of tons of coal on trains and barges through the wild and scenic Columbia River Gorge. The little bit of coal they're already sending blows off the tops of trains and into the Columbia and other waterways. Imagine if they increased it tenfold. I see the coal train coming, it's rolling around the bend. Coal dust blocking sunshine, whipped up my hard gorge winds. They're pushing coal to China to fill their money trucks. Spilling toxins in the water, but they don't give up. <laughs> oh, oh, it's hard to sing so much coal dust. When I was just a baby, here's what I was told. Son, we all need energy, but don't you burn that dirty coal. But some folks just won't listen or need the warning signs. All they see is a bunch of zeros on every leg. With their narrow thin criteria, don't you think they feel some guilt? I dream of a healthy future, our gorge so clear and free. But those cold plants keep them moving, and that's what tortures me. Welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy uh, and our Populist Dialogues program is to create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Ryan Rittenhouse. Ryan is the conservation organizer with Friends of the Columbia Gorge. He is also long, has a long history of environmental activism with, among others, Greenpeace USA. So welcome to the show, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Good, yeah. So that was a great video we just watched. Yeah, yeah I'm glad you liked it. Or, I, I did. It makes it makes coal sound entertaining. Yeah, which well. Which is certainly isn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, talk, about, um, talk about coal as an export. Sure. So we've got, well, we used to have six uh, new terminal proposals in the Pacific Northwest. And they wanted to export, and they still want to export coal from the Powder River Basin in Wyoming and Montana all the way down on rail lines through the Columbia River Gorge and uh, to terminals uh, both near here, uh, west of Vancouver, and also up north in Washington near, um, uh, uh, not Bellingham, um, but, uh, or no, it is Bellingham, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and there's uh, three of those remaining. So three of them were canceled, and that was a really good victory that we had. But there's still three left, and all told, they would export uh, 100 million tons of coal a year uh, that is mined out in the Powder River Basin. And this map here uh, shows that. Um, the f there's two large land terminals that would 
focus on having coal arrive by train, and then they would put it on ships and ship it overseas to Asia. There's one smaller one that would still export over 8 million tons of coal a year uh, that would put it onto barges out near Boardman, out where the coal plant is now, and they would put that on barges down the Columbia River and then put it onto ships and then ship it overseas to Asia. Okay, and where, where would they put it on ships? Uh, down near uh, Port Westward, uh, that general area, the ocean-going vessels would come up the river a certain ways and meet up with the barges, and then they would transfer the coal from the barges mm -hmm. to the ships. Yeah, okay, so. and so why, why should Oregonians, why should Washingtonians, why should Americans be concerned about whether we do or we don't export coal? Right, well, coal is of course the number one cause of climate change, and you know, sort of speaking in a general broad sense, that is the number one issue with, with this coal. Uh, coal is, you know, per pound of energy you get out of it, not pound of energy, per unit of energy you get out of it, uh, is by far the dirtiest form of fuel we've got in terms of global warming emissions. Uh, so this, in terms of new um, fossil fuel developments worldwide, is the fifth largest in terms of CO2 potential. So we've got to keep this coal in the ground. Um, it's extremely wasteful, both economically, but also in terms of environmental preservation, to be digging this coal up as basically as fast as we can and shipping it wherever people even remotely want it and letting them burn it. Um, and this is destroying the planet now. Uh, we're already seeing effects from climate change, and if we don't do something to curtail that, it's only going to get worse. Um, in terms of Oregon and Washington, there's also many local uh, concerns to take into account, not the least of which is coal dust that comes off of these coal trains. Um, as you saw in the video, there um, are every now and then incidents where large plumes of coal dust can come off these trains in, in significant large amounts all at once. Uh, typically that happens because the coal, is, the coal train is traveling really fast and a crosswind hits it just right and it kicks up these big plumes. But even if that's not happening, these coal trains are constantly shedding dust as they move along in little bit, little bit by little bit. And it averages out over the course of the whole trip to about a pound of coal per car per mile. Mm -hmm. And that maybe it doesn't sound like a lot, oh, it's just a pound of coal, but that's per car per mile. Right. And these coal trains have hundreds of cars on them and they're talking about going from what we currently have, which is four coal trains a day, to over 20, maybe even 30 or so coal trains a day moving through the gorge. So that's a very significant problem. But also you've got all the problems associated with not just the environmental Im impacts of the runoff of that coal dust, but the health impacts, and also the health impacts from the burning of the coal, people think. Well, it's being burned in Asia. Well, 10%, it's estimated, of that pollution will end up right back here in the gorge communities in the Portland, Vancouver area. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, we all live on one planet and the things we do affect what happens everywhere else. Mm -hmm. So we've got better alternatives. The Chinese are working on better alternatives as well. Um, and even the, the larger pure economics of it seem to not be working out in the long run for this coal export proposal. So our goal is to postpone and prevent and delay these developments as long as possible because we're pretty confident that um, as China develops their renewable energy system more and as we develop our renewable energy system more, um, they're going to shut down um, their coal plants and mm -hmm. not want to build any more. In fact, China just recently announced that they're forming, uh, I forget how much it's going to cost them, I think over $8 million to, or maybe $80 million, I can't remember, some large amount of money uh -huh, yeah. to, do, uh, to invest in a research facility to study smog in Beijing and throughout China. Um, and I can save them all that money and say, just <laughs> stop burning coal. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. It's like, do we really need to research this? Not really. Yeah. We've, we we, we know what's, need to research what's the it, solutions. So. So I, and I think that's what to, they're uh, probably going uh, to do right. is, is they they want to research ways to get it cleaned up as uh -huh. fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So they have very big problems with smog in China, as I'm sure most people are aware. Uh, yeah. And the number one cause of that is all yeah. the coal they're burning. Yeah. yeah. yeah and and I, I remember, you know, as a kid growing up here in Portland, that we used to get you know, really bad smog. Yeah. And there was a lot of coal burnt here. Yeah. And that and went away. A as well as, you know, we had a lot of wood burning, sawdust yeah. burning furnaces that you know, yeah. we used to use for heating when I was a kid. And there's some days that we still have smog problems yeah. in the gorge. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have it with me, but we've got a picture that shows um, the same landscape and half of it is on a clear day and half of it is on a bad smog day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think like Mount Hood is in the background or something and you can't even see it oh, yeah. on the bad day. Right. Uh -huh. um, and it's not, you know, it's not that's not a picture of the rain, it's smog, and that's very different. 
um, and their direct health impacts from that. Yeah, so. yeah. So let's talk about friends of friends of the Columbia Gorge. Sure. So who is it? Why why so why are you friends with the Columbia Gorge? And <laughs> talk about the scenic area a little bit and Absolutely. how that developed. Sure. So Friends of the Columbia Gorge is the only nonprofit organization that's specifically committed to preserving and protecting the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area. And in fact, we were very instrumental in getting the National Scenic Area passed. Um, and since then, <coughs> we've been working to uh, protect it. And this is a, this is a federal, a yeah, federally it's created. Yeah, it's sort area. of like a, um, a national park or or something like that, or a wilderness. But it's far less restrictive in terms of um, what people can do there. Because and and we realized that when we were forming it, because you know, in a national park, you don't have what is it, ten to twelve municipalities already existing in it. Yeah. So when they were looking at this, they realized we've got to come up with something unique, something that's going to preserve the environment of this <coughs> area, but also allow for development in the existing places where people live and work. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was where the, the ideas for National Scenic Areas came from. They don't have the strictest environmental uh, uh, protections, but they do where it really counts. So, you know, the Dalles is, exists completely within the National Scenic Area, and they want to be able to continue commerce and production and development of their city. Mm -hmm. And they're fine to do that. But outside of their urban area, if you cross over into the National Scenic Area, Special Management Area, or General Management Area, there are lots of very important environmental restrictions and regulations to prevent overdevelopment of the gorge and the destruction of that beautiful landscape and beautiful natural resource we've got. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we do, that's what we focus on. Uh, we have a land trust, we spend a lot of our time and efforts, I don't, but we have people that do, on preserving land, buying land, fixing it up, getting it, um, returning it to its wild state, and getting it in the public trust, so to speak, so that future generations can enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, and we also do a lot of education and outreach, we do a lot of hiking programs, a lot of people aren't aware. We lead, I think it's over 160 or 180 hikes every year. Um, and we try to get um, experts to go along on those whenever we can, botanists or wildlife specialists to educate people about what they're seeing on the hike and things like that. Mm -hmm. And if folks are interested in finding out more about that, you can go to our website, gorgefriends.org. We've got a whole hiking section. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I do is the conservation issues. Um, and so we're aware that the only threats to the gorge aren't just people who want to put up housing developments. There's also things like these coal exports coming through got the oil trains that we're worried about that we might talk about later. Um, and even right now, we're also fighting a natural gas plant that they want to build in Troutdale, right on the doorstep of the National Scenic Area. Um, and this is a power plant, natural gas plant, that would generate uh, over 500 megawatts of power. Um, but they want to put it right on the edge of the National Scenic Area, right on mm -hmm. the Sandy River. And that's not the right location for this. And our first and utmost priority is preserving and protecting this this very important. Yeah. yeah and so this would, this would be a, a power generating plant. Yes. Is that yes. Okay. That would run on natural gas. Uh -huh. Right. And natural gas is um, I hesitate to say cleaner than coal. <laughs> it's less dirty than coal. Uh, yeah. I'll put it that way. Um, it only puts out about forty percent to fifty percent of the CO two, and it doesn't have any of the heavy metals that are really really toxic and and dangerous in coal like selenium and arsenic and cadmium that sort of thing. But it does put out a lot of NOx, a lot of smog, which we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, I was just looking up the numbers and I believe it would be, um, if it were built, it would be a quarter of the current level of industrial NOx emissions in Multnomah County. So that's a hefty addition all at yeah. once uh -huh. to our NOx levels at a time when we are trying to reduce all that stuff. I'm sorry, NOx or what? Oh, NOx, nitrogen <laughs> oxides, okay. uh, N-O little x, meaning oh, any okay. oxide of nitrogen. Uh -huh. um, and that is one of the major pollutants that comes out whenever you burn a fossil fuel. And it's one of the main contributors to smog. Sm the power plants don't put out smog in smog form. They put out kind of a cocktail of all the things you need to make smog. Uh -huh. And that's volatile organic compounds, nitrogen oxides, um, and uh, all those sorts of things. And when they combine with sunlight and the heat from the sun and, o and ozone as well, they combine to form smog. Um, and that's, that's one of the biggest pollution problems we've had in, in general around the world in terms uh -huh. of industrial development. Right, okay, yeah. And, and um, you touched on it. So we're, you're concerned about the coal coming through uh, yes. on the trains. Uh, and you're also concerned about oil, oil being transported through the gorge. Yeah. So talk about that one a little bit. Sure, yeah. yeah. That's a really big one. Well, I've got a picture here, too, of one of the oil train explosions mm -hmm. that have happened over the past year. This one was just last December uh, in Castleton, North Dakota. Um, what's going on is oil prices have gone up considerably in the last over the last few decades. 
And so there are oil reserves now that weren't economically feasible to develop before that are now being developed. A good example of that is the Keystone XL pipeline, which is bringing tar sands oil from Canada uh, down through the center of the country. I'm sure most people have heard of that. Mm -hmm. So tar sands is one example. Another example is shale oil, where they do hydro hydraulic fracturing like they do with natural gas, only it's for oil. And they frack this, these shale developments and pull oil out of it. And that's called, um, uh, well, in, in, this, in this example in North Dakota, it's a, called the Bakken oil formation, oil shale formation. So they call it Bakken crude. And that um, form of crude oil is very much more volatile than normal crude oil. Uh, and that's something that we're kind of learning as we experiment with it, which is not a good way to learn something. Uh, right. And the, the railroad companies and oil companies are shipping this stuff like they used to ship just normal crude oil. But what they're finding is when they have a problem and the train derails or it collides with something, normally normal oil would just leak, maybe catch on fire, but it, would just, it wouldn't explode. Well, these trains with this Bakken crude are exploding because it's a very different form of oil. It's a, it's a very volatile form of oil. And so we've had, I think, six now in the past year, maybe a little bit more, uh, oil trains like this explode. And one of them exploded in Lac Miganti, Quebec, um, last summer. And that blew up the center of town and killed 48 people. Um, so these are massive, massive explosions. You can see in the picture that's a giant fireball. Mm -hmm. And we're very concerned about those oil trains being added to the already overburdened rail system that we would have if all these coal trains go through. And, and they would be running on the same tracks. They'd be running on the same tracks. And that's one of our, uh, another one of our concerns is these, all these cumulative impacts. You always hear us talk about cumulative impacts. You never hear the industry talk about uh, it because yeah, they want right. to ignore them. But coal dust, when it gets on the tracks, it deteriorates the ballast and makes it more likely that you can get a derailment. Uh, coal dust is not uh, friendly to mm -hmm. the railroad tracks. And so you're going to be running oil trains on these same tracks that are deteriorating quickly and you're going to have them running through all these gorge communities, you're going to have them running through Portland and Vancouver, and you know what happens if one of these oil trains derails or collides and explodes in downtown Portland or downtown Vancouver? It would be a catastrophe, mm -hmm. a, an epic disaster that we've never even seen before mm -hmm. here, aside from you know the volcano erupting or something. Uh -huh, so, right. um, so this is this is a really, really big problem that we're very concerned with. and. Um, you know, we don't, we're not against trains. We, we think trains are a good idea for the most part for transporting the things we need to transport. Uh -huh. Our point is we don't need to be transporting uh, this oil and, the, and this coal. We've got to start getting our sources, our sources of energy somewhere else, and it's not worth the risk. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people, even people who aren't necessarily against transporting the oil, are saying, hold on, take, let's step back a minute and not move you know, a whole, uh, blindly with all these oil developments and all these huge oil terminal expansions that are proposed here in the Pacific Northwest until we've addressed the safety issue of these oil trains. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Port of Portland just announced that they will not be accepting any new permits for oil terminals in Portland until this safety issue is addressed. Oh, really? We were very oh. glad to see that. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, but, but I, I think Vancouver has done, Vancouver, Washington has done just the opposite. They're actively yeah. Uh, yeah. quarrying. And granted, they were, to be, somewhat fair to the, the port, they started moving ahead with their project for this big new huge oil terminal they want to build in Vancouver before most of these explosions and derailments mm -hmm. happened. Now that they've happened, the port is admitting, oh, we didn't know about this at the time, mm -hmm. and they still have yet to do their safety assessment. So hopefully when they do that, they'll realize, yeah, we aren't prepared for this. We need to put a hold on this until at least we realize what we have to do to make this safer. Mm -hmm. um, we say, let's just not do it at all. We don't need it. None of this oil would be going to us. Um, and we're also very worried that they, ultimately the end game is to bring tar sands oil in from Canada and ship it overseas. Because uh, Canada is just chomping at the bit to get this their, their oil out however mm -hmm. they can. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, and of course they're doing the XL pipeline yeah. uh, down to Texas so they can export it. Uh, and and I, I think a lot of Americans assume that you know we're developing these type, uh, these pipelines and all this for our energy use, when in fact these companies want to export it. Exactly, and the oil is a little bit trickier. Um, it wouldn't, we wouldn't use it here. They they are supposed to still use it in the U.S. And a lot of the initial oil from the Bakken formation would go probably down to California, but there's consideration all the time to be lifting that restriction on exporting American oil overseas so that could happen at mm -hmm. any time mm -hmm. and you know remember the oil market is a global market and the prices are set globally um, based on the global economics of the oil trade and we can't really affect that really by drilling more here in the US or anything like that 
And also, like I said, we're very worried that they'll start bringing in Canadian oil, and that, of course, can be shipped anywhere uh, right. currently. Okay. Uh, oh, 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 okay. Yeah, so if they brought Canadian oil in, they could go ahead and export That's that because the restrictions yeah. are on export are on of American-produced oil. oil. Yeah. Okay. You know, are there? The, I, I take it there are not any restrictions on on coal produced in the United States that could be exported now. Yes. Mm -hmm. in and the LNG. LNG, I don't know too much about. Um, there were some proposals for that here. I think that's been dying down a uh -huh. little bit more. Um, thankfully, uh, LNG is another e explosive issue. Yeah. Um, double entendre. Yeah. There, but um, yeah, we and we haven't been involved in any of the LNG proposals, though some allies of ours have been. Uh -huh. um, but no, we're we are very concerned about the coal, mostly in the oil. Mm -hmm. And getting back to the coal, just briefly. Um, the, I, there's uh, some other slides you might be showing that show the derailments of the coal trains, uh, that one of them that happened out in eastern Washington a couple years ago. And we've got a good uh, graphic that shows the, what the coal piles are visually compared to the skyline of Portland. Um, and that is just the 8 million tons from the barge proposal alone, uh -huh. uh, not to mention the other you know, 90, 92 million <laughs> tons a year right. that would be uh -huh. going out. So this is an enormous amount of coal. And one of the biggest issues out in Montan Montana and Wyoming and that our allies out there are really fired up about is that this is public coal. This is on public land, and our government is basically practically giving this coal away to these foreign multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, on average, it's about a buck a ton, and they're able to turn that around and sell it for typically around $100 uh, dollars a ton in Asia. And that's a huge, massive profit that they're oh, making yeah. at the expense of us, you know, oh. we're, we're losing money on that, the American people, because we're not getting the value of our coal. They're, and we're also paying most of the health uh, costs of it uh -huh. as well. Great. Thank you very much, Ryan, for being here. Oh, I yeah. Thank it. you. Okay, good. We're going to run a video of uh, uh, which was uh, produced here about, coal, about oil trains uh, going through the gorge also. I'm really concerned about the crude oil trains that are running through here every day. There's massive increases in these trains proposed. I live a third of a mile from these tracks. The tracks run literally right through the center of Rainier, and in order to back out of your parking place, you have to back up over the tracks. Two trains collide in a fiery crash in North Dakota. In November, a 90-car train derailed in Alabama. In a derailment in Quebec last July, killed 47 people. A parked train came loose, picked up speed, roared off the tracks, and exploded in the middle of the night. Burnt rail tankers are still steaming in the heart of Lac Megantic, Quebec. If there were an oil train explosion here or near my house, we would, we would all be vaporized. Right now, the Northwest stands at a threshold. And the explosion in Quebec should be seen as a cautionary tale, really, for other communities, because we've got schemes right now on the drawing board for 10 port terminals and refineries that want to take oil trains, uh, all from North Dakota, all carrying the same type of combustible, volatile fuel uh, right through our communities. We have never seen oil trains anywhere near this capacity before. In the Pacific Northwest alone, we're looking at 10, 11, 12 loaded oil trains each and every day. All of it originates in North Dakota, from the Bakken Formation, and it heads down to the Columbia, to the Port of Vancouver, Port Westward in Oregon, Grays Harbor, and the five refineries uh, along Puget Sound shorelines. It's extremely difficult to imagine how first responders would deal with a situation where you had an oil train exploding in central Seattle or Vancouver, Washington. Um, there just isn't very many places for people to go. I'm the president of uh, Longshore Local Four in Vancouver. Oil export terminals don't employ a lot of people. They take a lot of land and there's not a lot of people working per acre. So with the oil terminal coming into uh, Port of Vancouver, longshoremen would be the guys tying up and letting the ships go. But our local said, you know what, no, the risk isn't worth the reward. I mean, we don't believe in jobs at any cost. You know, one accident there puts us out of work, period. And it put, it'll put thousands of people out of work. 
if you got oil in the water, you're not moving anything until it's cleaned up. And they, we've seen over and over again, they don't do it quickly. I mean, it's just, it seems like it's just a matter of time before something bad is going to happen. And it, and it would be something that I would worry about taking my kids down to the heart of Vancouver, you know. I'm a new grandmother, and I want my grandson to be able to grow up in a place where he doesn't have to worry about oil trains exploding. This is an issue for Rainier, Oregon, Washington, and the entire nation. Please sign this petition opposing dangerous crude oil trains. So our guest today has been Ryan Rittenhouse. Ryan is the uh, conservation director at Friends of the Columbia Gorge. Visit the Friends website at www.gorgefriends.org. And if you want to be involved in the efforts to stop coal trains from traveling in the Columbia Gorge and from being exported at all, contact Ryan at Ryan at Columbia, excuse me, Ryan at gorgefriends.org. Another way to be involved is to visit the Power Pass Coal website at www.powerpasscoal.org. And don't forget that the Alliance for Democracy is sponsoring a screening of a new documentary, The Healthcare Movie, which tells the real story of how the healthcare system in Canada turned out so different from that in the United States. The Healthcare Movie shines a truthful light on the sustainable system that supports the health, dignity, and financial security of all Canadians, and it does it without the costly interference of healthcare insurance companies. That's the key. So come join us on Wednesday, April 30th at 7 p.m. at the First Unitarian Church, Southwest 12th and Salmon here in Portland, Oregon. And the directors of the film will be there for and after the movie discussion of how we in Oregon and the United States can move from a health insurance system to a health care in system. Don't forget you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash populist dialogues to view most of our past shows. And when you're there, click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you'll automatically receive an email notification. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Alliance for Democracy Portland chapter. Learn more about us at www afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. Thank you to Roger Bates, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. And to all of you watching, thank you. I hope you'll watch again in two weeks. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before, Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock. Cause I never heard my money talk. When a corporation has a colonoscopy, then I'll believe they're human like me.